people in power, and I'm Summer El Shahat. On today's program, the forgotten country. <laughs> Although he's been holding talks with opposition leaders this week, the sense of crisis surrounding Georgia's president, Mikhail Saakashvili, shows little sign of diminishing. For a month now, protesters in Tbilisi have been calling for his resignation, furious at Georgia's humiliation by Russia in South Ossetia last August. And one of his army's regiments recently staged a short-lived mutiny for much the same reason. But defeat in Ossetia is only part of the problem. When Russian tanks crossed Georgia's borders, 10,000 Russian soldiers were also moving into Abkhazia, another breakaway republic. A few weeks later, Russia recognized both South Ossetia and Abkhazia as independent states. The West refused to accept these claims for autonomy and has now severed almost all relations with Abkhazia. Though this seems only to have pushed the state deeper into Moscow's embrace and increased tension in the region. So what lies behind Abkhazia's bid for independence? And could it lead to yet another war and more pressure on President Saakashvili? Michael Anderson reports. Parliament Square in Tbilisi, Georgia, April 2009. President Saakashvili because he got them involved in last summer's war, disastrous war against Russia. But most of all, they're angry because he lost South Ossetia and Abkhazia. Вот абхазскую сторону он подарил вообще без боя. Нельзя воевать. Надо диалогом это делать. Soon after the war, Russia granted both South Ossetia and Abkhazia diplomatic recognition as independent states. Irakli Alasanya was for many years a close ally of President Saakashvili. He was in charge of negotiations on Abkhazia and Georgian ambassador to the UN. But now Alasanya has become one of the leaders of the opposition against Saakashvili. Saakashvili is the problem because he promised so much that we all knew that he could not deliver. We all knew that the, in a few years, even in five years, the Abkhaz and Ossetian conflict will not be resolved. And raising the public expectations on that was the main mistake, I think, of his presidency. And uh, he got caught uh, and cornered himself within his own promises. Accepting the reality after the Russian recognition of these two Georgian enclaves, uh, it's not an option for any politician or any Georgian. Why should we lose it all of this? Why? Why should my daughter leave? Why? Why? She, haven't, she has never been in, in Abkhazia. Why? But I spent my childhood in Abkhazia with my relatives, with my, with my friends. And she, was, she has never been there. Today, the Georgians blame the president for the loss of Abkhazia. But in many ways, the man to blame is not President Saakashvili, but the Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin. Stalin, who was himself an ethnic Georgian, simply loved Abkhazia. He spent months here every year, relaxing, holding court, having picnics with his communist comrades. This dacha called Coldstream was the dictator's favorite. It is closed to the public, but the APAS authorities granted us access for this film. In this dacha, overlooking the Black Sea, Stalin would sit and plan the killing of millions of innocent people and even some of his best friends. Thousands of soldiers in the mountains and forest around the dacha would be guarding the paranoid Soviet leader. It was from here that he would move around millions of people from different ethnic groups, all to make sure that they would never unite and be able to challenge his power. 
In 1931, Stalin incorporated Abkhazia into the Soviet Republic of Georgia. He moved hundreds of thousands of Georgians, Russians and Armenians into Abkhazia, making the Abkhaz a minority in what they considered to be their own country. By doing this, Stalin turned Abkhazia into a time bomb and pretty much guaranteed that what ought to have been a paradise with the sun and the sand and the sea instead would turn into a bitter zone of ethnic cleansing and war when Soviet power broke down in the early 1990s. In 1992, Georgian forces attacked in response to vociferous Abkhaz demands for independence. One year later, the Abkhaz, with the help of Russia, pushed the Georgian forces out. 15,000 people had been killed and practically all ethnic Georgians, a quarter of a million people, had been forced to flee Abkhazia. International organizations criticized both sides for having committed ethnic cleansing. Today the international image of Abkhazia is that it has become an annex to Russia. But down here on the pier in the main town of Sukhum, they tell me a rather different story of how Russia became their main, or rather their only ally. A leading journalist and a member of the opposition assured me that democracy is doing fairly well in Abkhazia. The Abkhaz foreign minister is Sergei Shamba. Все наши проблемы сегодняшние возникли как раз в период правления Сталина. И когда Абхазию, вопреки воле ее народа, по воле Сталина сделали частью Грузии, ну, дело не в том, что только Саакашвили. К сожалению, и европейские, и вообще западные политики, многие поддерживают эту сталинскую модель. Но вот это, конечно, несовместимые представления о реальности. Поэтому мы никак не можем согласиться при Сталине. US President Obama and other Western leaders have sworn never to recognize Abkhazia, or what they call the Russian annexation of Georgian territory. Это демонстрация, еще одна демонстрация, серьезная демонстрация моральной деградации. Это, это синдром холодной войны, это реакция на Россию, даже не столько на Абхазию. Никто не знает, что происходит в Абхазии, хотя объективные наблюдатели, которые здесь есть, они делают совершенно другие оценки, что Абхазия на самом деле развивается как демократическое государство. Many Western experts acknowledge much of what the Abkhaz had told me. Tom Trier has worked in Georgia and Abkhazia for many years. Abkhazia is far from a perfect democracy, says Trier, but the Western portrayal is also not fair. Um, no, it's certainly not fair, but it's, it first of all shows how little we know of the situation in Abkhazia outside of the region. It's much easier just to consider Abkhazia as a, um, as a uh, puppet state completely controlled by Russia, but it, it very poorly reflects the reality on the ground. In his recent book, Tom Trier describes how the West in the 1990s effectively abandoned Abkhazia. And the European states were very occupied with the Yugoslavia in the mid-90s. They uh, supported the policy of, uh, of uh, states' integrity, and they supported the, the, the Georgian side. Uh, the West did very little in terms of engaging uh, Abkhazia. In 2003, Misha Saakashvili and his Rose Revolution took power in Georgia. Saakashvili would soon become the darling of the Bush administration, and within five years, Georgia's military budget 
increased no less than 50 times. Sakashvili came to power on a clear promise to reintegrate Georgia uh, within the next few years. The policy has been contradictory because on the one hand, Sakashvili has stressed again and again that we want to reintegrate these territories only by peaceful means. At the same time, on the military side, we have seen enormous investments in the military and doesn't exactly transmit the signal that, uh, to the Abkhaz that Georgia is interested in peaceful solution to this, uh, to this conflict. The war in August 2008 resulted in Russian diplomatic recognition of Abkhazia. But at the same time, most of its relations with the West were cut off. So although the Abkhaz celebrated, has the Russian recognition in reality left them even more isolated? alone with Russia on the front line of the new Cold War. After the break, is an independent Abkhazia really sustainable? Or would it just be a Russian puppet state? Join us in a moment. Hello and welcome back. Nationalists in the breakaway Georgian state of Abkhazia have always underpinned claims for its independence by citing a distinct history, culture and political identity. Well, last year, as a byproduct of Georgia's humiliating defeat in South Ossetia and with the help of Russian troops, Abkhazia did win a measure of sovereignty. But in the months since, there's been an uneasy standoff, with Georgia's embattled president, Mikhail Saakashvili, under increasing pressure from his political opponents to get Abkhazia back. And Russia just as determined to ensure it stays within Moscow's sphere of influence. So is an independent country called Abkhazia really viable? Or can it only retain its autonomy by hanging on to Russia's coattails? <laughs> Today, the last thing you see when you cross from Georgia into Abkhazia apart from border guards telling you not to film here, is a giant billboard of President Saakashvili promising to reunite Georgia. Because of the constant skirmishes, the border can only be crossed on foot. In its propaganda, Georgia uses new methods, such as music videos. This one, for example, won the contest for the most patriotic Georgian song. Showing happy, beautiful people returning to Abkhazia, again part of Georgia. But the reality, of course, turned out rather differently. After the war in 2008, Russia recognized Abkhazia as an independent state. Timuri Yakubashvili is vice prime minister in charge of the reintegration of Georgia. What we have now is uh, subjugation of Abkhaz by Russians, subjugation of Ossetians by Russians, that they call it liberation or recognition. And in reality, we have 20% of Georgian territories occupied by Russian forces. But the Georgian minister is in no doubt that Abkhazia and the Abkhaz will come back to Georgia. Abkhazia is not lost. Uh, we know where it exactly it is. It's occupied. It's occupied by Russian occupation forces. But it's a 21st century, and losing territories to other countries will not happen. Russia never ever will be able to swallow either Abkhazia or South Ossetia. At first sight, Abkhazia looks more like the end than the beginning of a new country. This is the southern part of Abkhazia, the Gali region. Before the war 16 years ago, 90% of the population here were ethnic Georgians. They had to flee from the Abkhaz in 1993, but since then half of them, 40,000 people, have returned. 
international NGOs have rebuilt some of the local schools. Across the road are the barracks for the Russian troops here. You can even see the tanks hidden under the tarpaulin. Experts say that 10,000 Russian soldiers are now based here following the war last summer. Far from the independence they were seeking, in many ways Abkhazia is now a Russian client state on the front line of a new Cold War. And quite predictably, soon the KGB showed up and shunted us not so gently on. I'm on my way to meet some families uh, who are ethnic Georgians who have actually returned here to Abkhazia. I first met them a couple of years ago, and uh, in the meantime, the Danish Refugee Council have been helping them out with housing and education. So I'm very interested to see how they're getting on now. The children were at school, which is great progress from the situation when I met them three years ago. <laughs> the children's mother died several years ago. Since then, their grandmother has been bringing them up. So during the war, they were that side, Georgian side, uh, they were banished and uh, the house was burned. And after a few years, they returned and they got some. Somehow they covered this uh, house mm -hmm. and after that, they, they got our assistance, uh, some material. The Danish Refugee Council has provided them with building materials. The aim is that all families here should have one safe dry room. Yeah. The family has less than $100 to live on per month, money they get from Georgia. The area is lawless, riddled with crime and violence. Why did they decide to come back? Because it's, it's, it's pretty dangerous to live here. Yeah, yeah, she said that it was danger, but for, that would be the same if you die by hunger or by shot and they decide to return their house. Today the train only departs twice a week and only to Russia. The rest of the world is still upholding an economic blockade against Abkhazia and not recognizing Abkhaz passports. Sixteen years after the war with Georgia, many of the facilities on what used to be called the Soviet Riviera lie in disrepair. But still, every summer, Abkhazia is invaded by millions of Russian tourists looking for a cheap holiday. Even Abkhazia's so-called capital, Suhum, seems to exist in a time warp. The genteel dilapidation of its former grandeur alongside the bombed out ruins from the war in the 1990s. But the Russian recognition of Abkhazia has already brought changes. This is what Hotel Abkhazia looked like in its Soviet heydays. The hotel was bombed during the war and is only now being restored with Russian money. For the first time, one can see advertisement signs for estate agents here in Abkhazia. But there is another sign of the coin. Because of the Russian recognition, the West has almost completely withdrawn from Abkhazia, paradoxically, in effect making the Abkhaz even more dependent on Russia. I think it's a mistake by the international community not to have a more uh, constructive dialogue with Abkhazia to prevent that Abkhazians are left alone with the Russians. Because as I see, this is what is happening now. But to most here, security is the most important issue. Вооружили Грузию, обучали Грузию и опять это делают. Что касается России, то с Россией у нас договор подписан, равноправный договор, реальным фактором обеспечения нашей безопасности. Люди впервые за последние 15-16 лет почувствовали, что угроза войны отошла на задний план. У нас есть огромная 
потенциал в наших взаимоотношениях с Россией. Для развития экономики Абхазии это больше, чем достаточно. Для обеспечения нашей безопасности это более, чем достаточно. The Abkhaz government does all it can to keep alive the memory of the war 16 years ago. At school number 10, these 13-year-old schoolgirls showed me this school's honor board. We see students is still there, Nikos. Yeah, yeah. Oh, shucks. In our class, there is our hero, whose name is Klaas. Yeah, we do a good time. We do a good time. We invite our parents, our relatives. Рассказываем его биографию о нем, все, ну, говорим. Очень много родственников моих, кто погиб на войне, и это просто тяжело да. вспоминать. They are no doubt about the bright future for Abhazia. Я хотела бы стать, ну, врачом, и хочу поступить в Краснодарский колледж, там, медицинский, чтобы хорошие врачи были в Абхазии. Как, как ваше отношение с Россией? Мы очень любим Россию, да. она нам во всем всегда помогала, и мы очень благодарны ей. Мы вообще очень рады, то, что грузины живут не здесь, а там, в Грузии. Большое человеческое спасибо им за это. Да? Да. Back in the Georgian capital, the people were angry at their president because the country has been torn apart. But most still believe that one day they will be reunited with the Abhas. Пройдет время, совсем немного времени, и новое поколение, и мы в том числе опять протянем руку дружбы, братства и любви. The Georgian president and his ministers keep promising the Georgians that Abkhazia will come back. But in reality this is not going to happen. The question that remains now is whether Georgia and the West can accept this and still establish some kind of relations with Abkhaz or whether we will leave them alone with the Russians on the front line of the new Cold War. That's it for this edition of People in Power. If you'd like to comment on our report or any other matter, we'd love to hear from you on the usual address, aljazeera.net forward slash English. That's it from me. Until next time, bye-bye.